Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome. Happy New Year, everyone. Um, my name is Carrie Ann Anderson. I'm the event supervisor for Amazing Arthropods. Um, and my background, I don't know, I've got a lot of background. Um, I have a master's in wildlife management, which doesn't really qualify me for arthropods because my specialty was birds. Um, I taught at Wayne State University in the Department of Education, so I at least have an understanding of uh, what, how children test and how to study, so I might be helpful in that aspect. Um, I work at Lake St. Clair uh, Metro Park in the Nature Center area, and um, we host workshops for this particular event. I host a part one and a part two. Uh, it used to be termed beginner and advanced, but I kind of scratched that because I felt like even if you've had this before, it's not a bad idea to refresh that information. I'll, get over, I'll go over exactly what I go through in the workshop in this. And I am a mom. And I used to coach this event, and I was like you, sitting in a chair going, what do I have to do? <laughs> like, really? I have to catch insects? I'm going to catch insects in January! I'm a biologist! I know that's not even close to being possible. So I sat there many moons ago, and I was just as frustrated. So, welcome to Arthropods! <laughs> if you haven't been here yet, you are going to learn to love this subject. And you're going to get very comfortable with insects. And you're going to have lots of shoe boxes in your freezer. It's going to be fun, OK? You're, and you're going to get hooked. How many people here have been doing this for multiple years? Because you're hooked, right? It becomes easier each year you go through this as a coach and you learn the tricks to the trade and how to make things exciting for your students. And when they do well and they get excited and they're not coming out in tears after the first event that they go through, then you feel well accomplished and proud of your students and you're ready to teach more the next year. So, um, If you haven't already gone on the Science Olympiad Elementary website, and clicked onto Amazing Arthropods and downloaded the current rules, that would be your step one. Actually, step one was getting here, which is <laughs> awesome because a lot of schools don't come to this event, and this helps, okay? So current rules, that's an important thing to have. Um, if you've been through this before, um, you'll notice that several of the rules have changed from last year, right? It's my contention that if a child enters into Amazing Arthropod in third or fourth grade and they continue with Amazing Arthropod up through fifth or sixth grade, then it seems to me that they might have an advantage over somebody who's coming in the first year mm -hmm. if the information is always the same, okay? So that frustrates me as an educator, right? It's not impossible, because I'll tell you, I've seen some of these young kids come in first year and whoosh, sail up to first place. And you're like, who was that mass man, you know? Um, but it's harder on them, for sure. And I don't want students who have done this for a year or two years think they don't have to study because they've done it. And I've heard it. Little kids will come into my nature center and they'll be like, hey, Miss Carrie Ann, yeah, can't we buy the prize this year? I don't have to study. And I'm like, oh, really? <laughs> well, I'm changing 50% of it this year, and they do the face drops, and they're like, no! Shattered dreams of winning first place and not trying. Um, so yeah, there are some changes here, okay? Um, so the first thing that you see is that in a general sense, you're going to be teaching your students arthropod class. Arthropod classes, and, and believe it or not, there are a number of arthropod classes we are not focusing on, because that would be next to impossible. So you have six arthropod classes you're focusing on. That's where you start with your students, right? 
once they have a firm grasp on what goes into arachnida or pilopoda or columbula or diplopoda or insect or malacostraca or whichever way you want to pronounce it is fine with me, okay? Because it's not a verbal exam. If you're really that person who wants to say it correctly and you want to teach your student correctly, you can type in any word that you can possibly imagine into like an Emma Says YouTube and it'll spurt it back out to you the correct way, right? So you can have your kids, first thing that you want them to do is get them on YouTube and have them start typing up these really strange words and just learn how to say instead of, instead of, let's see, one of them. We used to say chilopoda. That's what we were saying at first. And then we typed it in, it was chilopoda. Why is it chilopoda? It's a C-H, but you know, it gets confusing for kids. Um, Efeminopteral, that's a fun one, right? They're gonna, it's like a tongue twister. So you can just have them learn how to use the words themselves. Um, but once they're comfortable with the arthropod classes, then we dive further into one particular class, and that is insecta. Not everything they're learning is an insect. So as a coach, you're gonna catch yourself calling a spider, an insect, and you go, oh, wait, that's not an insect, you know. Um, so then we dive into insect orders, and I believe there's 12 of those, let's say, for 14. Oh, 14, sorry. Oh, yeah, I added Ephemeroptera and Megaloptera because of the common misconception along Lake St. Clair of what a fish fly is. Yes, if, you're, if you think you know what a fish fly is, you might be pleasantly surprised that you've been lied to all these years. Um, so, there's like, did anybody look that up or is anyone surprised when you were like, oh, that's not actually a fish fly. Wait a minute, what is a fish fly? And then you look at Megalopter and you're like, whoa, I've never seen a fish fly in my life. <laughs> okay, um, so we dive into these insect orders here. So after they know the classes and then they dive into the insect orders, <coughs> that's when you move into some specific species information. And I have the species list for you here. That's the major change for this year. Um, I never understood, with help from some of my other coaches from previous years, why it was called Amazing Arthropods, but all the species were actually insects. So I wanted to broaden the spectrum for arthropods in the species-specific list. So that's why you see Malacostraca, Arachnida. Um, notice there are two orders being highlighted this year for insects. We're going to focus on Hemiptera, or Hemiptera, sorry, and Coleoptera. So those are the two that we're focusing on. Why did I choose those two? Because they're commonly um, uh, misidentified between the two. They have a lot of um, similarities. Next year, it will not be Hemiptera and Coleoptera. It'll be another two orders from the Insecta um, category. That will keep it, the playing field, a little bit new for the kids who have already had this before. So that's, um, that's how I would recommend studying the massive amount of information you need to know. Um, the study guide has been reduced dramatically. For those of you who were not here before, the study guide lost about 40 pages this year. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> to help focus you on um, what I think is more applicable for our uh, elementary age children. Um, so when you look at the study guide, which is available to you to download and print, there's a nice table of content. It tells you the basic taxonomy of arthropoda. Um, talks a little bit about anatomy. Why is an arthropod an arthropod and not something else? Um, there is a identifying key in here for you that you'll have your students kind of play with. If you remember from your old bio courses, it's uh, like classification keys where you, the diachronomous key, where you ask a question when you're looking at a specimen, and you answer that question, depending on how you answer it, you either have 
the result or you have to keep going and asking more questions until you get a result. <clears throat> it's, it's a way of looking at a specimen and understanding key terms like if it has eight legs or not, right? Um, if it has wings or not, okay? Um, and then, of course, it gets very specific as you're getting closer to the actual um, answer to the question. And then also a big focus on metamorphosis. And you have all the specifics for each type of metamorphosis <coughs> process and who belongs where and why in this study guide. So those are some additional pieces of information. As far as new information for studying purposes, I developed this workbook for you. So this way, you can make multiple copies of these worksheets, give them to your students, and see how they do. Okay? The first time it's going to be a learning process. They're going to use the internet. They're going to use books from the library. They're going to um, ask Alexa, I don't know. But they're going to find the information, then you look it over and make any corrections and discuss. And then this is a tool that you can continue each week when you meet, meet with your students to see if they have achieved that level of knowledge. And this is mainly in terms of arthropod classes. And then it also focuses on the two insecta orders. Um, and it's a lot of anatomy. Why do I focus on anatomy? It's because that's what places them in those specific categories when classifying. So um, it's, it's important to know the anatomy in order to understand why things are classified as such. So I made that for you. Um, as far as the as far as the species go, I developed a workbook. So if you were to make a workbook for each species, you could divvy it up amongst your teammates and say, hey, you're going to take these three species this week and you're going to take these three species. And you answer the questions in the workbook based on those species. Then they come back together the next week and you have them discuss it and teach each other. Not every child has to know every detail, right? They're working as a team. And when you teach something, you learn it and you know it more than you do if you're just um, reading it. So, Is that available on the website? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a filled out one and a blank one. The blank one, obviously, you would make multiple copies. And the filled out one gives you as a coach a little bit more information as to what I'm actually asking. I mean, some of it's draw or copy a paste of, or, uh, or paste a picture of the arthropod here. So I have to find it on the internet. Uh, any cool facts you found. If you find a cool fact about something and you share it with a child, they're more likely to remember that thing because they think it's cool. Um, describe the habitat. Now, if I just told you to describe the habitat, you might be like all over the board. You could look up habitat of a centipede and read like 45 pages and be like, well, what does she really want? Well, I gave you bullet points. Where would you most likely find this arthropod? What does this arthropod need for food? When are you most likely to see it in Michigan? And how does it survive its winter? Four very simple questions for an elementary age student. So this workbook is available to you as well. Do you, do you have an answer guide for the first one too? The, like the workbook, the, not the study guide, but the workbook that you did the other workbook? Do you have an answer guide for that or is it like, they're doing it. I could almost... get you an answer guide. I don't know if you would need it, but yes. Okay. A lot of it's found in the study guide. Oh, okay. Except for maybe the last two pages. So yeah, I okay. could I could post that easy. Just throw the answers on there, highlight them, and okay. Call it a coach's manual. Okay. And, and <laughs> that that works available on the site as well. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. So before I move into um, the collection process, do I have any questions about the information that's needed? You are, you are able to get a 8 by 10 worksheet filled to the max if you want, front and back. It's like their cheat sheet for the tournament. They can bring it in, one 8 by 10 sheet. It could be written, it could be typed, 
it can be loaded, it could be just the three or four things they've struggled with and you know they're going to panic on, or they keep transposing something, those are the things that I would recommend putting on a um, cheat sheet. If you put too much, then I've seen it happen where they rely on it too much and they only have a minute per station. So they kind of look at their cheat sheet and they take 45 seconds just mm -hmm. finding where that might be and they actually know the answer. Is it front and back? It is. It can be front and back. So <laughs> 8 by 10 specifically not a copy paper. No, it says 8 and a half by 11. 8 and a half by 11. Thank you okay. very much. <laughs> You're funny. Yeah, go by the rules. They're all posted. But a sheet of paper, yeah, just can't be some poster over here, you know. I, I'll tell you, most of them won't even use it. I know if you're going to measure it. Uh, minute per station, best thing you can do for your students is um, give them some mock stations, and that's something we do at the workshop that I hold. A um, couple main things, figure out who's going to fill out the bubble. They fight over who's going to fill out the bubble at each station. They're not going to place. So I'm telling you that right now. And what's, what's even more sad is they know they have the knowledge, and then they're going to do so poorly because they lost all their time fighting over who fills out a bubble. So you got to have that bubble filler spot already determined, and practice filling out the bubble, and practice staying in line. Okay. So some students start at question 52. Okay, and Let's say this station is 52 through 55, but they only got 52, 53, 54 done because they ran out of time. They have to rotate to the next station, which is 56, but they forget they missed 55. It's like, and then they're done. So practice that. Download and print, which is available here, the actual form, and practice it. <coughs> Absolutely practice that. Um, this aspect. How much time do we have? Are we like done? 12, 5, 12, 12. Oh, wonderful. Okay, I'm going to slow down then. Okay, so any more questions about. Is it download and print the form yes. question guide? How do answer form. the question? It's called a zip grade form. Grade. Like a scantron for us older people. <laughs> it looks just like a scantron to me. I don't know why it's called zip grade. No, I know why. Um, so yeah, I would I would do a bunch of those because here's another kind of strange thing. It doesn't start with number one here. It, there's like another number sequence up top, and that's really just for their school code. And some kids start up there. I will tell you, because I'm a mom and I don't want to see any of these children go through that text anxiety and a mistake like that, I am stationing volunteers at number one and I'm saying, you make sure they start here. And before they rotate, I say, if you have any blanks, just yes, fill in something so you stay on track, you know. So I am doing my best as an event supervisor to ensure that each and every child has a fair chance for these <coughs> zip grade forms. Some schools use them, and so the kids are fast, and they know. Some schools, this is the first time they've ever seen one, and they panic. They get very flustered, okay? So don't let game day be the first time they see a form like that, please. <laughs> is the test only bubble? Mm -hmm. There's no written. Is there written? The written will only be a tiebreaker. <coughs> so I have a hundred questions, and one <coughs> station of questions will be determined as a tiebreaker. The only time I look at the tiebreaker is if there's a tie. I don't grade it at all unless there's a tie, and that is a different format, yes, because we're really splitting hairs here if two kids, two teams actually got an exact score. It happens. There are uh, previous years sample questions that kind of look at so we can create practice. Yep, there are. Things like that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. On it's on the website and also the workshops, like I said, we hold mock um, uh, tests. Do you have the dates of those? The workshops. Yeah. They are. I do have them. And, and they are also on. Oh, 
You know what? That's probably what I found in here. I don't know what they gave me. Oh, thank you. Does anyone need the amazing arthropods? If you need one, if you don't just pass them because they didn't give me very many. So if you've already. It's just the rules. I just have them. There should be one. You have it already, pass it. Yeah, before I pass it. Yeah, you have it. So that's your starting point there. I don't need this at the workshop. No, no, the workshop is are also on here. Um, I can give them to you verbally if you want to write them down. Now, of course, when it comes to arthropods, there are several different workshops. There's stuff taught by the DNR, Shadbush Nature, Nature Center, Stony Creek, and Lake St. Clair. I can give you the Lake St. Clair ones. <laughs> you can go on the website and get the others. Um, Saturday and Sunday, so February 9th and 10th, I'm holding my first set or my first session. What I'm doing on, the, on those particular days, you would do one of the three sessions I'm doing those two days, um, classes and orders. I will make sure your students know all their classes and all their orders before they leave my workshop. And having fun doing it. Like they're gonna shout it to the mountain. Like for jumping for joy. And then, and I know this is gonna sound a little weird, but my second session isn't until April 13th and April 14th. That is after the practice tournament. And I'll tell you why. That one I focus only on the species list. Okay. Can I have the reason why it's after the tournament, it's an overwhelming amount of information. I'll be surprised if you get to the species list before the practice tournament. I never did as a coach. It's just a lot of information. Okay. Um, the first session I run, we meet arthropods, or we play with live arthropods, and it's fun. Um, the second session I run, we go out and find them in April. And they're allowed to keep them. We can. Picture. A picture is acceptable. Okay. It is. It is. For, for the. <coughs> we need to sign up. You do. You call the Nature Center, 586 4332, and you have to register and pay in advance because they fill out fast. You say that in 586 463 4332. So I already registered it. They didn't say I needed to pay in advance. Shame on that. Yep. Uh, how much is it? Six dollars. I have the list if anybody wants to take a picture of it. Oh, okay. Four. I can put it up here on the table. The one is yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then you have to have the next one. Which one? <coughs> the first session is February 9th or 10th. On the 9th, I'm running a 10 a.m. and a 2 a.m. session. Yeah. 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 Will you do Once that class again and it's somewhere else? Or is there it are other ones, yes. Is that you're yes. teaching? Not me, no. Okay. Yeah. No. There's other nature stuff. For the, <clears throat> when the kids have to bring in live specimens or the picture book, right. is either one of them weighted differently? Right. You know, is it more are we to ready to move on to that? Oh, okay. okay. I think we are? Okay, so that's everyone's fear, right? Okay, so moving on to the arthropod collection. You have a choice. Whether you choose to collect specimens and pin them in a specimen box like you see up here, or a photographic collection like you see up here. Okay? It says in the rules that you can purchase for like $50 a Cornell box, or you can grab a empty paper box from your school's office supplies and cut the bottom in half 
and the top still fits. And now you have a wonderful way of allowing your children to decorate and put duct tape all over and make it their own and you're not worried about it breaking. And I'm telling you, even if it's in a Cornell box, it's done by kids, so it's not going to be perfect. And no, I wouldn't score it any better if it was in one. The styrofoam you can usually get from any Amazon package you've received in the past month. Or you can go to Home Depot. It's pretty cheap. Are you allowed to mix specimen? Like We're not. Okay. Um, the photographic collection <clears throat> has to be photographs taken by you, not the internet. And <clears throat> um, it's, in my opinion, more difficult to, to accomplish a full point value. Not because one is better than the other, I grade them identical, and I have a rubric for you. I don't know if there's any educators out there, but when you give a bunch of coaches a rubric, when you get the results, I'm flying through them now, because everyone knows exactly what I'm looking for. The first year, there was no rubric, no expectations, just stuff coming in. So there's a rubric here, so you, you know your score before you turn it into me. Is that on the Hands website down. as well? It's on the website this year. You know your score coming in, right? Now, you could have something misidentified, and I'll catch that. Um, so the score could be slightly altered, but really you know going in if you have a perfect score, or if you <coughs> missed something, just couldn't find it, no big deal, you know? Um, the reason why I say this is harder, insects are fast. Pictures are blurry. If they're blurry, I cannot grade it. If the lighting's wrong, and I cannot determine if it's a coleoptera versus a hemiptera, I cannot grade that. Some things are extremely small, like fleas and columella. Good luck. Good luck. I have to believe you actually have an iPhone. I don't know if it can get a picture of a columella. I don't know. They're so tiny. So, and if you're, you're in that stage where you're like, I don't want to kill things, well, in order to get a picture of a lot of these things, you're going to have to freeze them just to get them immobilized <laughs> to get a picture of them. So, just saying, okay, you're going you're gonna to get desperate one day. You're like, I can't get a picture. Oh, just kill it anyway. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's hard. It's hard. But I put a photographic collection up here. They received a 98 out of 108 points. Um, where were their point deductions at? They did not get two orders. That's it. That's all that was wrong. They just didn't find two orders. So a 98 out of 108, I would bat this team placed. Because that's a high score. I also look for duplication. I will look at these pictures, all the picture ones I put together, and I look for duplication. I find duplicated pictures. So I do find them off the internet. Yikes. Okay. Um, are you, as a coach, going to go and catch all these insects and make your kids watch you as you do? <coughs> Yikes. Okay? Sometimes I question those boxes a little bit. So it's just, it's, it's your moral moment, okay? You just tell the kids, I'm sorry we didn't find a columbula. We're not going to throw a bunch of dirt in a vial and say we did. And try to pull one off on Miss Carrie Ann. It's just not going to happen, okay? We're going to go in, we're going to hold our head up high and turn in what we have, even though we missed two orders. Right? Own it. This is what you have. This is how hard you work. This is what you have. You're going to turn it in and you're going to do your best. So, um, in terms of I have the rubric for people. Go ahead, ask questions. Well, 
terms of the insects that are supposed to be in the collection, are they supposed to mirror the list that we have here? Or is it any insects that you find that you want to label or order? Here's the thing. On this, if you, I don't have a lot. So we'll just see what comes out of there. Sorry, guys. Okay. So on the rubric, <coughs> the first thing it states is you get three points for every arthropod class collected. Okay. Are you restricted to Arachnida, Chilotoda, Columbula, Diplopida, Insectae, and Malacostraca? No. You can find a different arthropod class. But those are the common ones. Okay? So <clears throat> you can have a maximum of six unique classes. So any more than that, it's a moot point. I'm not scoring them. Okay? So your max score for class is 18. Your max score for insect order is 50. And it says five points for each unique insect order, maximum 10. Okay. I have the word other there because sometimes people surprise me with the thrip or something. I'm like, whoa, where did they find that? That's so cool. You know, but these are the common ones. So yeah, it's usually those. Do they have, and they have to be from this area? Midwest yeah. region, okay. yes. So if somebody goes on vacation to Florida or Tennessee or something, that doesn't work? No. Okay. No. Um, and then it's a 30 specimen thing. So here's the thing, and the specimen cannot be a duplicate. Meaning, if you meet the criteria of Hymenoptera because you found an ant, you can't give me 30 ants. <laughs> Right? One, that's going to give you zero point, or it's only going to give you three points for finding an insect. It's only going to give you five points for finding a Hymenoptera out of 50, right? And you're not going to get 30 because it's the same, if it's the same species of ant. Now, is this the pavement ant versus the carpenter ant versus, you know, termite, all this stuff? Yeah, fine. I'll give you scores for those. But it's 30 specimens maximum. You start throwing 60 specimens in there, and it's just going to be harder for me to grade. Find your best 30, because when they pin, things are going to go wrong. So when you collect a roly-poly, a malacostraca, don't just get one. Get mine 20. Okay? <laughs> this is like insect pinning 101, best one to choose to try. Okay? So you got to relax them out of the roll. you got to get that pin in right, or they break in half. So you don't want the one amazing gray mantis that you found dead on a piece of wood when you were looking in the log, log pile, you don't want that to be the first thing they pin, okay? Because then the tears are going to happen, right? So practice on the ants and the flies. You got like 20 flies in a window, practice on those. And pick the best one, because some of them are going to be like this way, some of them are going to be like the opposite way, and you're like, whoa, what were you thinking? You know, so pick the best one to put in your, in your thing to represent it. I have a question. So last year, I had a third grader who wasn't really any uh, dexter. Yeah. So, <laughs> and um, is it going to be acceptable? Last year we took, and if it was a really hard to pin object, we put it on a tiny cardboard mm -hmm. triangle. Yep, and then you the glued it to the triangle, and then you were just pinning the, the triangle. triangle in. It's so right you're here. Not cracking the body apart. This is available to you, and it gives you helpful hints for those little tiny things. Okay. It also states now you are allowed to use insect vials. The vials are for soft-bodied organisms only. I'm going to be a stickler on the grading for this, okay? So please don't give me 30 vials, which <laughs> it happened last year. First of all, there, it's difficult to identify something in a vial as a person grading, scoring. So these vials are filled with alcohol. There's a video on here to teach you exactly how to pin, a video to teach you exactly how to use the vials. Soft body things. Spiders are wonderful in these. Right? Because their legs are going to fall off. You're going to freeze them, you're going to bring them out, and all their legs are gone. And then you can't really call it a spider. Right? I have to be able to identify it. Okay? Spiders go in here. Uh, centipedes go in here. Their legs fall off. 
Freeze them first, don't just throw them in alcohol. Trust me, your kids will see something really amazing if you do that. Not good. Freeze them first, make sure they're dead. You understand that some things have to stay in a freezer for months before they're actually dead, right? What? Yeah, because they'll come back to life because they winter in Michigan. No. Uh, in your freezer. Okay. Is that Make all sure they're done too? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> each critter. Um, fleas. Spring tails. Um, more soft body. Uh, mayflies. The thing you guys think are fish flies. Mayflies. They'll fall apart if you don't put them in here. Um, millipedes, some of our dip diptera, like a mosquito, or a gnat, or a fly, uh, not a fly, uh, crane flies fall apart. So those are the things that you would put in a vial. And then I show you how to pin it into your uh, box. But on day of turning in your box, all of your vials should be in a container like this and right before you turn it in you pin them where they belong if you pin them first and you carry it and it's in a car and your kids are going like this and they drop it your vials are gonna roll around and knock the head off your dragonfly they're gonna ruin the antenna on your um, lepidoptera they're gonna make a mess of your box okay carry it in here first then um, on the back of the rubric, I score things that are a little bit more of an opinion, but like it meets the requirements of the size, um, things are, are dated properly, <coughs> professional pins were used, you can get those and the vials today if you need to, um, or the proper cameras were identified. If it's misrepresented, looks like an adult did it, stuff like that, I deduct one. Pins are available. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? So the kids will pin them out of the box. In terms of collect, like say near, you know, in a pond, something that's like hidden, are the kids responsible solely for catching, or can be like, you know, Choose your best judgment. I mean. You might get excited and just go right dive in the pond. I get it, you know. I get excited about that kind of stuff too. As long as they're there, they're helping, they're participating. It's not like you're going out on your own, hiking, collecting 10 insects and bringing it back to your kids. If you're facilitating the hike, you're finding it together. And at the very last minute, the child freaks out and won't get it. Yeah, help them out, okay? It's all right. It's all good. We're coaches. We're parents. We're good. Uh, shall, I, uh, oh, sorry, shall the collections of the four kids be together, or can we like split up and divide and go hunting? Oh no, that child can be in their backyard and something fell in their pool. Yeah. Oh yeah. They just have to make sure every time you collect something, you write the information immediately. I'm telling you, you're gonna think, oh, I'll remember. You won't. Remember. And then you're going to be stuck making stuff up in front of your kids. You don't want that. You're going to be like, oh, yeah, it was this day. Oh, I really don't think it was, Dad. No, it was. Do they need the special box for the practice? No. Please do not bring anything like this to the um, practice. I've had people bring me them and be like, oh, can you just tell me how we're doing? I can't. Because then everyone didn't get that opportunity. Do not bring me cocoons that are still alive, okay? Don't pin something on your way to turning in your box so that its legs are still doing this when I open it up. Uh, if you're going to do a crawfish, look up how to properly make sure it doesn't stink when I open the box. Yeah. Okay, think of me opening up about 80 of these and I only have about four hours to grade them. The whole room stuck because of one. Oh. And is it not true that the entire science of the team can correct, collect specimens? I made that adjustment. Oh. Yes, ma'am. I made that adjustment 
because I fear it was happening anyway, and then again, our children were being taught to say it was someone else that collected, <laughs> to be untrue. So yes, the team can collect, absolutely, as long as your team <coughs> is on that box, or on this, you tell me the team. You mean the entire Science Olympia team, or just the two from that event? No, no, no. The team for arthropods. Some some groups have like six kids that are on the team and only two make it. But they don't know this until like a week before the tournament. So they've all worked just as hard. Yeah, we don't either. We're like grappling, grappling for anybody to do it. So, so like my daughter's on an alternate team, but there's like the, the main team. Do yes, she is all, part of the team. So they can all help each other. Absolutely. Okay. So for those specific species, yes, real quick, those are not on the practice test. What? The specific species list that we have, those are not on the practice test. They are not weighted as heavily as they will be in the last part of the okay. tournament because I feel that. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Sorry, we've been able to speak.